parameters, universities. So all typologies of um, of the value chain that are grouped together for 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 the common objectives, basically related to quality, to research agendas, to analysis of uh, opportunities in the world, to sharing exhibitions uh, in different points of the planet, to debates on multi-client, multi-product. And I have to say that this type of initiative, which is quite uh, common in the Basque country, is very uh, powerful um, in terms of the conscience that the sector can generate in the organization of the of the companies. And myself, I am. my name is Juan Hernani. I am the CEO of Satlantis. Satlantis is a uh, is a company specialized in uh, space optics, uh, miniaturized space optics uh, that we have now almost a decade of, of work uh, and five missions uh, in space uh, since our first flight. We have worked with all the space agencies, JAXA, NASA, ESA, and, uh, and uh, uh, last year we were awarded uh, with an with a honor position by the Euroconsult report on optical technologies whereas Atlantis uh, had the leading position. And I uh, have not come here to talk about myself, but rather to introduce uh, the debate on, um, on the morning, uh, the second morning session. Um, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Christian Weimar. Uh, he is uh, head of materials in the Central Research uh, and Technology uh, Center at Airbus. Uh, we can see from the from Christian's uh, CV that he has a typical or or a very solid uh, German engineering footprint uh, that starts with a deep knowledge in in materials material science uh, in all respects. So I guess he's going to talk about uh, sustainability and new materials used uh, by Airbus. So we are very eager to to listen uh, to to his uh, talk. So guten Morgen, um, Christian. Herzlich uh, willkommen zu EACP. Du hast das Boden. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Johan, um, for your introduction. Hola, everybody. I hope you can see uh, my uh, presentation now. Yes. So I get started. So I will give you a few on the requirements uh, for future materials and processes technologies, um, which is really key, let's say, to make um, supply chains also um, um, sustainable and to, to pave the way uh, to introduce new um, products. So let me set the scene in the beginning. Um, I've put on the right here the uh, targets 2050, which are the, um, the which is the flight path 2050, the ACAR goals, uh, which are uh, quite um, ambition, ambitious in itself. If you see a uh, like minus 75% um, CO2 um, reduction overall, and then also minus 90% um, NOx, but also 65% um, um, of noise, which is uh, really part of part of the game, and we also have to consider this. So let's take that spotlight. On the left, you see the forecast for air traffic uh, 2038, which is a prediction coming from um, pre-COVID, from 2019, where we have been projecting um, an annual growth of 4.3% um, of air traffic. And it also then uh, quite a relevant figure um, would see then a need of almost 40,000 new aircraft to be built and also the requirement for um, having new pilots. So that was pre-COVID. Now we had this, this big impact hitting us um, um, last year and we have seen some uh, details about the effects already in the, in, the, in, the, in the session one this morning. Now we see also um, that air traffic is um, slowly recovering different and uh, different continents. Um, you, you have some publications around there and also significant info. Um, Airbus has released last week um, some information about the potential recovery of the production rates, especially for the, the single aisle, which is also, let's say, showing and indicating that we can expect um, that we are with the, the um, air traffic coming back in 2024, 25, potentially even to uh, something we had in mind before. So that's, that's the scene. And uh, on the other hand, um, 
we see that um, sustainability is the key element. You have also um, heard about the European Green Deal, which sets quite some, um, let's say it sets bound boundaries where we want to go, really ambitious targets. And we, we have to, to do that if we want to maintain that um, the future generations can be um, traveling uh, like we do and can enjoy this uh, the, the mobility yeah, overall. And here I wanted also to explore a bit about um, urban mobility, which is maybe also an aspect to be considered. If you look at the time frame of plus five, plus ten years, you might also see some, some changes there. Um, it is maybe regional mobility changes, um, urban mobility which is coming we have been um, hearing about uh, startups working airbus is also active in in this field so overall we have to think about an um, um, sustainable air travel and this is not only in the air uh, and i will come to that later it's also about um, setting up our um, industrial or defining our industrial footprint of the future which includes some materials and process technologies so I want to explain with this chart, if you see here, looking at the CO2 emissions of all millions of tons um, coming here um, from pre um, presented from 2015 to 2020. And then you see the little dip here, uh, quite a significant dip um, from the, um, the COVID crisis and then um, a projection how we will come back and then Looking at, and this is where I want to draw your attention, the industrial 2050 goal, where you see this um, overall, let's say, rough 75% reduction and ways how this could be achieved. Yeah? It's really a, pro a projection. And you see, and this is what I want to say, there are several elements in it. There is, on the one hand side, there is um, offsetting, not so much, but maybe in the in the transition phase, um, quite important. Uh, then you have a part of the orange one, which is operation and infrastructure, which contributes a bit. You will also have uh, an impact of um, using sustainable aviation fuels there, but, um, uh, and this is uh, to be uh, really um, looked at, technology effects like electrification, we heard about hydro hydrogen, you know, hybridization, then um, taking over quite a significant part of the, the contribution then um, let's say in the 30s onwards um, and they are growing. So everything is, is needed if we want to maintain um, being on this cross, fart, um, cr cross path. So I'm, more, I'm a materials and process guy, so I'm more related to, <clears throat> let's say, uh, the overall um, life cycle uh, from starting from where do we get our raw materials from? How, what are we doing um, with those? Uh, what is our um, best lightweight design solution? Then what is the associated process technique resulting in the manufacturing um, um, technology and setup infrastructures behind that? Then supply chains uh, for the, the structures, but also intermediate products, then following to operation and how to maintain, how to, to repair. Uh, you are um, you are your aircraft and maintaining it in the air and then more and more significant also looking at end of life and uh, recycling solutions so this is a very important part we have to tackle including the need that we go for new technologies mentioning hydrogen or electrification for example where we have from the beginning also consider this full life cycle chain so airbus is also uh, committed to the sustainable um, development goals from the United Nations um, and I would like here to highlight uh, the number nine and number 12 where there's not only the, the propulsion uh, systems but it is also um, overall um, CO2 action it's about responsible consumption of raw materials tracing of raw materials um, having more um, um, biosourcing inside and going towards um, reusing um, these materials um, again. So, and for the uh, propulsion, I uh, would like to highlight there, if you talk about fuel cell, if you talk about electrification, you also need to have your materials and process technology ready, capable um, of dealing with this um, new requirements, be it cryogenic or be it uh, that you have to deal with more um, conductor or more power, um, in your aircraft, meaning that you have to deal with temperature distribution, temperature flow, heat flow, etc. 
So, um, so what is the role of materials and processes? Uh, we have to think about um, how we increase system performance at low weight, um, uh, including multifunctionality. We have to think about, uh, and here with multifunctionality, I explicitly also mean printing in electronics. So today we have too often the situation that we build a structure and then we have a system and then we bring it, we integrate it. In the future, we have to think it more um, in, in, all, in, in, a, in a common uh, approach, meaning also we have to think how we would qualify such um, systems and how we would be able to maintain. This means also here predictability, um, knowing about what our performance in the future will be. Eh? I'm talking about um, time is up. I have the feeling, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm concluding my, my speech um, that, for example, you, you have an H2 on board, um, you have a tank, you want to know what is the, uh, the level you have there. If you have not um, leaks somewhere, which could be quite um, dangerous and uh, safety and durability maintains to be key, especially in such an um, um, scenario where this has to be really of, and it remains of paramount importance. So responsibility in the use of raw materials enable circularity. Um, I addressed it before. It is really key and I want to have one sentence on it in one of the upcoming slides. And of course affordability and cost still is key. We heard 3D printing. Um, there is in my view the beginning of the journey. We really have to um, uh, leverage on all the opportunities coming there, starting from design, but also at very lean um, um, supply chain uh, opportunities. Um, about this, about circularity, we have an Airbus vision um, 2030. We want to uh, have no more wastes for landfilling and incineration, reducing the environment footprint um, there. And we have to come up with good and viable solutions um, for, for that. And this is it's, it, it's, of course, for, for composite, CFOP, but um, it is also um, that we look at um, uh, using and bringing our um, metallic materials also in at the same level as we had uh, before. Uh, the evolution of feedstock, and this is also very relevant if we look at, for example, the, the polymer-based uh, composite. We, today we are based on crude oil. We trans uh, transform this crude oil into our building blocks for um, for the matrix, for thermoset or thermoplastic, or for the carbon fiber, and we see already um, moves, um, we, we see already moves that we use more algae or, or more 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 plant based uh, channels to have a bioethanol, biomethanol as a building block to create your your polymers then later, which is really having a, a direct impact on your CO2 balance and could be up to direct air capture techniques where you can not only go for e-fuels, etc., but you could also think of bringing this into um, the, the polymer um, supply chain. Uh, digitalization will play a key role there, starting from the design of your material, testing it and bringing it into, uh, into a service, maintaining a good quality during the supply chain, connecting all of these elements. This will really help us to speed up the introduction of new technologies for our new uh, products in the future. So these three examples I wanted to share with you. There we are setting up technology pathways in order to, to fully leverage on them. And in conclusion, um, I want to repeat sustainability overall is a key driver. Um, it's of course the, for the flying um, um, uh, part of the life, but also for the, the whole life cycle from raw material from cradle to grave, so to say. Lightweight is key because um, um, it's, it's the history of aviation. Everything we have to bring it in the sky. Um, don't have to to um, to try, yeah, to propel. We have to have a holistic life cycle view in the future, much more than we had in the, in the past, where we really looked at the, at the product. Now we have to consider where is the raw material coming from. What is the impact on on the CO2 balance? And at the same time, looking at what is happening after life. How can we extend life first, make sure that we can maintain the mission, and then how do we bring it back into the circle? And new designs uh, will be based uh, by new digitalization opportunities, this taking into account the full life cycle, but also things like fast testing, faster qualification um, and certification. So thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christian, uh, uh, for your very interesting talk. Uh, I think we're going to leave. Uh, we have we are getting a number of questions through the chat, but we're going to leave it for the for the end, uh, the end session. So now it's time to jump into the next speaker. Uh, we're going to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, so it's not not only in terms of uh, transfer, but also in terms of time. So Kelly, good morning. What is the time or uh, what is the time now over there? It's uh, two thirty in the morning, which means I have the complete bandwidth here at my house. So <laughs> you, you have to forgive us. Uh, thanks very much for nevertheless joining to to the event. Uh, Kelly uh, is the senior manager for globalization and enterprise supply development uh, from Boeing. Uh, so I think we are we are touching here uh, an incredible topic of real global supply. There is very few companies that can really. Uh, talk about uh, uh, the issue of the planet uh, supplying the different uh, services and technologies that are re required for a, for a global company like you. So uh, we are really eager to learn from, uh, from your thoughts. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Really appreciate being able to participate on this panel today. And uh, just hello to everybody um, from the other side. <laughs> so, you know, conferences like these are just really important, especially as we work to understand the current environment and future post-COVID. Um, this conference here, which is focusing on the perspectives and new opportunities for aerospace supply chain, is really just a great way for us to start connecting and discussing those next steps. So I'm really happy to be able to share with you on the following slides more information about the Boeing company, um, how my position and our group can support, and also about the business and the supply chain environment. So looking at just the Boeing overview that you see on the screen here, uh, Boeing has had a long tradition of aerospace leadership and innovation. The company continues to focus on emerging customer needs and its broad range of capabilities, which include our commercial airplane family, designing, building, and integrating military platforms and defense systems, creating those advanced technology solutions, and arranging innovative financing and service options for customers. Boeing is divided up into three business units, as you can see on the screen here, our commercial airplanes, our defense space and security, and our global service organization, which actually began operations in July of 2017. Supporting all of these business units is our Boeing Capital Corporation. And their focus is on being a provider for financing solutions. Our products and services support our customers in more than 150 countries. And with more than 140,000 employees across the United States and in more than 65 countries. As you can see here on the the global supply chain. This is our global footprint. It includes our approximate supplier count and spend from a total company perspective, including all of our business units. And these numbers represent our direct suppliers. But I do want to emphasize the entire supply chain, including all of our sub-tiers, are very critical to our production system. Our suppliers around the world are key and part of our products and are seen as extensions of our own factory. Most of the supplier presence, as you can see, is in the United States. However, we are always looking for the best suppliers globally. Our business depends on the reliable movement of parts and people throughout our supplier network. And more, uh, more than 65% of the cost of our airplanes in the commercial side of the business is really into, um, all of the supplier factories in, in more than 35 countries around the world. We see European technology as an integral part of the Boeing's global operations. We're proud of our established and growing presence in Europe, as well as our strong partner and supply chain network, which includes many small and medium enterprises. We look forward to continuously advancing our footprint and business operations globally and to providing opportunities for additional industry partnerships. We are not going to get through COVID with business as usual, so things are going to need to change. And I'm hoping to address throughout the rest of my presentation, 
the environment we're seeing, our customer needs, the technologies we're seeing, what we want suppliers and, and programs we have in place to support those partners. The business environment, um, as we all know, we are seeing a lot of challenging times. And overall, the aerospace supply chain has seen a level of disrup disruption we've never seen before due to the impact of the pandemic. Yet there are pockets that remain robust, like our defense and space and security. But the drop in production has led some large suppliers and OEMs needing to reduce and sell portions of their business so that we can redirect resources to core activities. This in turn has created open capacity in some cases, pulling work that was outsourced back into the business to protect jobs and increase asset utilization. The reduction in commercial services production combined with insourcing presents significant challenges to suppliers, particularly those whose business is not diverse. In some regions of the world, governments are stepping up with financial support, but that's not the case everywhere. And as a result, we will see consolidation and acquisition as a greater rate in the coming years. The companies who have the resources and the will to make it through could find themselves in a better position. We're seeing it as a fluid environment like we've never seen before. And the sooner OEMs uh, can ramp up production rates, the more stable the business environment will become. Our customer expectations. Today, today's market is really highly competitive. Boeing's goal is to exceed all of our customer expectations, and our customers need that first-time quality, the value-added services, product reliability with low operating costs. Our customers also expect to provide environmentally friendly, progressive products that are innovated and differentiated from the market. That will enable long range and fast travel. If we look at our technology changes, the current business environment and keeping up with customer expectations uh, will affect the supply chain. Uh, the aerospace market has always been driven by technological advances that improve performance, quality, and expand capability. Short to long term, the six areas listed on this chart are opportunities for significant advancement. Companies who want to really work with us um, and have the, the drive to look at these areas can provide benefit with that advantage. I would encourage small and medium enterprises to access the Horizon Europe funding to tackle some of these technology challenges. With innovative technology advancements also comes risks and keeping an eye on the areas that impact our business, such as cybersecurity. I think we've all been experiencing some of that. As we move toward that digital thread and it's, it can be a pathway for that risk. And as we continue to become more connected, we need to ensure we take into consideration how we keep our data secure. Another area that Boeing and the industry are committed to is decarbonizing aviation and address the current challenge of climate change. As we know, it's a global issue that requires global cooperation. Our global supply chain directly contributes to Boeing's efforts always to improve the environmental footprint of aviation through innovation and new technologies and efficiencies. In fact, our Eco Demonstrator program has tested over 165 technologies on six test airplanes and made history by the first commercial airliner flight with 100% sustainable aviation fuel. Looking at our supply chain principles on the next slide, one of our key priorities is to operate with excellence in the Boeing company. It's how we work together to deliver safe products and services to our customers while also continuously improving our quality. What you're looking at here are our supply chain principles we recently rolled out to our suppliers. And these principles are expectations we have not only of the suppliers, but also of ourselves. So let me just kind of quickly run you through these five principles. The first one is really paramount with safety and quality in everything we do. The second really focuses on the relationships 
As suppliers are extensions of our factory, it's important we're committed to these key relationships. The third is on transparent communication, which is important to be able to jointly advocate for our mutual success and supply chain sustainability. The fourth is focused on delivery performance and fundamental. And lastly, the fifth is on sustainable conti continuous value creation to help meet the demand of all of our customers. So all of these principles together really mean that we collaboratively design quality and safety in all products and services. We commit time and resources to healthy relationships, and we're focused on communication with honest and integrity. Parts and services will be delivered on time, every time, as we focus on that continuum of value creation for our customers. So what is Boeing actually looking for? Uh, well, <laughs> From, the, from our perspective, we have certain expectations of our suppliers. It's important that you understand Boeing's products and services where your capabilities align within our products. Our suppliers must share our commitment to performance excellence and show that proof of financial health and ethical business practices. What we're looking for are really true team players who are open to continuous improvement and innovation together. My team specifically supports the development and growth of new suppliers, and we're really focused on streamlining that discovery and onboarding process. I personally have a global team that's available to connect with and support all the questions that you might have. I even actually have a couple of them on the phone with me today. So we support our category teams through ensuring we have that pipeline of qualified suppliers ready to step in when there is a need for more capacity, new capability, or to support any aspect of the supply chain where there is category requirements. Looking at the category requirements, um, we have six major top level sourcing categories across Boeing. And under each one of these high level categories are numerous subcategories. I really hope that all of you can see yourself in either one or more of these categories and as I mentioned, my team is made up of, a glo of global employees who are ready and willing to support the discovery, onboarding, and training of all of our supply chain. A couple of my, the last two slides that I have that I just want to touch on is, um, first of all, looking at the small and medium suppliers, we do have a global di supplier diversity program. It was established as a formal small business program in 1951. Uh, in the United States, strictly focusing there. But today, we're actually focus on, focusing on global supplier diversity and the leadership and oversight to ensure strategic execution across the enterprise for all suppliers that want to connect with our key categories. The program is viewed as a critical element of our strategic sourcing efforts in both government and commercial contracting environments, and it's aligned and integrated into our supply chain and directly supports our domestic and international business development pursuits. Lastly, I really am excited to be able to share a program that we kicked off in early 2020. It's called our Premier Bitter Program, and it's, co it's a collaborative program that really recognizes our high-performing suppliers using objective criteria. That program criteria is really divided up into four key elements, which is located in the upper right hand of this slide. The first being focused on quality and delivery performance um, with uh, you know, key uh, criteria that, that is developed for that. The second is approval of our Boeing supply chain agreement. The third is there should be, shouldn't be any major issues uh, from a commercial standpoint. Fourth, um, we expect that the performance of your bid is on time and, and compliant. The reason for this program is we heard our supply chain state that they would win performance awards but weren't receiving additional bids. So this is a program that we have listened to our, our suppliers and we've kicked it off currently in BCA production suppliers and we will be expanding it to our BGS suppliers by the mid-year. Overall, we've identified these five key supplier benefits in, in participating in this program. The first is we have quarterly bidder conferences where you can interact with our top performing suppliers. It enables the ability to interact with key leaders from our supply chain team, 
Currently it's virtual, but hopefully we'll get to that face-to-face. And then having topics and discussions relevant to the supply chain, we, we engage this group of folks and receive feedback so that we're constantly getting that information. And then also a visibility of upcoming supply chain bid activity. And then finally, um, it, there is extra consideration and in taking into account uh, our high bidders in this program. Since the inception of this program in early 2020, we went from 92 participants to 107 by 107 by third quarter. So today we continue to add new suppliers and appreciate our top performers across the globe. And with that, that's the end of my presentation, but I do want to just take a moment and just say that I really appreciate um, this event and the opportunity to present even, even early in the morning here. Um, and I also just want to thank all of my fellow panelists, because I know that this is going to be a great information that we'll be sharing with the supply chain. So thank you very much. Okay, Kelly, thanks very much for your talk. I think you should uh, consider working at 2 a.m. because you are really awake and uh, and, uh, and sharp. So it's uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for your words. Uh, you have also awoken uh, the audience because we have a large number of questions. I think it's fair to you to, to propose the questions now and let you have a coffee or go back to bed or whatever. But uh, just Oh, it's OK. I, I really don't mind waiting. I, I would love to see the rest of the panel presentation, so I'll wait. Well, I think we, we do the questions now and then you, you decide. But I think it's, it's our I think we're code of conduct uh, with, uh, with such, a, such a time gap. So um, people are talking about uh, uh, the supply chain and the digitalization effect, uh, the blockchain technologies. There was a few questions related to that. We know that uh, that the Boeing City concept of uh, getting your suppliers nearby, different to, for example, Airbus concept in, in supply. No? Um, how does that, uh, how the digitalization revolution affects uh, this uh, supply chain, including uh, blockchain technologies. Do you think that you are going to diversify your, your points of source or you will continue your culture of uh, being everyone at home? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, you know, as we step back and actually evaluate um, all of these technologies that are coming at us, you know, we are consistently looking at um, global supply chains. So I know that you had mentioned, you know, having that supply close by, and it is important to make sure that we do have all of our parts on time and having the product there to support our customer needs. But I know that from the perspective of where I sit in the company, as we align to our category requirements, we are really looking globally for all of those suppliers that can meet that innovation and technology needs that we have, especially as we look towards the future and what we need on our current and future platforms. Okay, thank you. I have another question related to geopolitics, no? Uh, that refers to China. And that will be what is the weight of China in the in the company sales and what is the weight of China in the company sourcing and how that does can affect the whole ecosystem of uh, European or Occidental supply, let's call it. Yes, I know that geopolitical you know, issues um, face all of us actually in the industry. And so it is really looking at what is happening around the world and how can we look at this to support our current needs in the aerospace industry. So um, specifically talking about China, I would say that, you know, we are a very big proponent in looking at the supply chain there. We have presence in country. Um, I know that personally, I'm also connecting with them on a weekly basis. And so it's really important for us to look at, um, you know, how we can partner together, uh, balancing the geopolitical issues that we have. And of course, our our company also has, you know, relations that are working on those daily with our own government and the Chinese government. So, you know, it's really important for us to make sure that we are evaluating what we need to do, um, balancing all of those risks out there and, and really supporting, um, like I mentioned early in my presentation, just our supply chain and the importance that we know of our current supply chain also, as I mentioned, being extensions of our factory. Okay, Kelly, uh, I think uh, thanks very much for your answer. I think you deserve a continuation of rest now. 
uh, your words have been inspiring because, of course, all the audience is related to aerospace and therefore all the value chain is listening so carefully at uh, your words and next steps. So thanks again uh, for uh, your special participation uh, this tonight, let's say. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay, uh, now it's time that we jump into our next speaker. Um, uh, we're going to talk about a fantastic uh, topic uh, that we, we keep in our genes and blood, and that's uh, innovation and innovation culture. And uh, to talk about that, uh, we have Joao uh, jo Pedro Taborda. Uh, Joao Pedro is Vice President uh, for Government Affairs uh, at Embraer Europe. Uh, he's covering a large part of the world, so it's Europe, Middle East, Africa, and he's been doing so since 15 years ago or 16 years ago. So you now it's a long experience uh, that, that uh, João Pedro can, can share with us. Uh, so, bom dia, bem-vindo à EACP. Você tem a palavra, João Pedro. Muitas gracias, Juan. Bom dia. It's uh, certainly um, a pleasure for us uh, and an honor to be to be in today's meeting. Uh, we, I understand you can see my presentation. Yes. Okay. And uh, certainly a pleasure. We, I'm talking to you today from from Portugal, where we do a regular job with the uh, with the AD cluster here, and uh, we certainly have a wonderful experience with the AACP in the previous previous event and also special to have again and also our good colleagues um, from NAG from the Netherlands where we have our regional headquarters. I will uh, use the, the time that you kindly provide me to update you on where is Embraer today, what we are doing. We are we made a couple of uh, announcements in the last week uh, in the area of, of EV tolls and, um, and autonomous and, and um, urban mobility that, of course, uh, I might want to, would like to share with you as well. But of, of most, of, most of all, and talking to a very distinguished audience uh, in Europe where we have such an important supplier base, uh, I would like very much to update everybody on what we are doing as a Brazilian based company in our footprint, not only in Brazil, but a little bit also in Europe. And of course, the, the R&D and the innovation challenges that we all have and, uh, uh, and, and also share some priorities with you on, on what we're trying to do. So with the general statement, we, we challenge ourselves to be the most efficient um, uh, and best aerospace and defense company in the world. That's, that's our drive, that's what we do and what we work as hard as we can and as effectively as we can every day, not only together for sure, but with, all, with our partners. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, an history of, of, of innovation, of challenging, so Embraer, most of you know, but we started as a state-owned company in 1969 from a, uh, an investment and, and a commitment from the Brazilian government that started back in the 40s. And uh, we, we developed our business and we were privatized and then we became a privately run company in, in 1994. Uh, we started, of course, with a strong DNA in, in defense but then we evolve also to work in other businesses and especially uh, more visibly today, uh, the, the work we do in terms of our segment of jets from 37 to 149 seats, where we, uh, the segment where we operate and we, we try to, and we reach an important milestone when uh, at, at 50 years of age in 2019, where we uh, consolidate our our position in in that in that market uh, with not only the ERJ family launched in the mid 90s but more recently with the E2 family as highly efficient aircraft um, provided to to our distinguished customers uh, among airlines will cause big commitment in terms of defense and security as you're going to see and also in uh, in business jets Starting with with uh, with our people, and it is important 
if you allow me to share this information with you and, and with the distinctive uh, audience in terms of where you might see opportunities in some of your cases, some, some of you more opportunities to work with us based on what we are doing today. We keep a very strong commitment in terms of preparing engineers. We have for about 20 now an internal program to develop our own engineers in Brazil. And of course, we also have initiatives outside Brazil to strengthen our knowledge base and to bring and continue to to lead in some areas in terms of our engineering capability. And that certainly connects with innovation and technology. You see a very simple matrix in terms of our diversification. You probably know us better uh, by our uh, products, uh, as, as just mentioned, uh, in terms of commercial aviation. So we're talking about known markets and known products and services and also business aviation, where we started to do uh, a stronger investment in around 2005, but also known markets like defense. Today, we have other opportunities where we are working also with uh, European partners, like, for instance, in space. We are uh, working with the Brazilian company, the government. We have a company called Visiona, a partnership with the National Communication uh, company Telebras, where we are using, uh, and, 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 and there was a decision of the Brazilian company to work with the Tal Zaleni, so that we, there's, a, there's a European satellite uh, in, in this very strategic project for the Brazilian government, where, where we are uh, contributing as well from the beginning. We also have a big project in terms of cust uh, and border surveillance, where we are, we have a project for 17,000 kilometers of Brazilian border. New competencies where beyond building airplanes, uh, we, are, uh, we are developing uh, other competencies where we need the best possible partners. And of course, also here, our C390 Millennium, where we are proud to have already two European customers beyond the Brazilian government. Uh, and, uh, and suddenly very important partners in terms of the development uh, and, and, and the construction and, and the assembly of this uh, of these aircraft, not only our plants here in Portugal, but also strong customer, uh, a strong supplier base in countries like Germany, France, the UK, uh, and and our uh, resharing partners in the, in the in the Czech Republic. Then, uh, in terms of new markets and new products, uh, I mentioned to Embraer X, where we have uh, we, are, we started to announce our first uh, orders and the first project, especially uh, with our launch customer, the Alo helicopter, where we might reach 200 EV tolls uh, to starting to be delivered in 2026, and also in Brazil. Um, very recently announced um, a partnership with a big helicopter company called Elisul, also in a, in a project that might reach 50 EV tolls and, and develop this market also, also in Brazil. So we are taking our first steps in, in terms of, of our EV toll uh, and our urban mobility business has a disruptive and, and a business where we are, again, trying to diversify based on what we do. And again, uh, new markets where, for instance, from 2005, we, we made the development of, of smaller jets and uh, what we call the entry-level jets and introducing new customers to, to jet products. Maybe in, as, as we spoke already this morning uh, about the programs uh, and, and we are, we try to be good customers of the EU sponsored uh, uh, programs and we've been participating in EU funded uh, proposals since 2006. We, we would like to share with you this 10 verticals, so areas where we are doing work already. Are, well, today we don't have the time to go into detail, but of course uh, we, we certified in 2004 the first aircraft to fly in ethanol only, at the Ipanema, and now we are working on, uh, on its, its electrification, also with the involvement of ADP, the Portuguese energy company, 
uh, also based in, in Brazil. Urban mobility, autonomy, of course, very, very important for us uh, as well. And platform platform based services and the advanced manufacturing and design, the 4.0, where we look at our own manufacturing capabilities here uh, in, in Portugal, where we have, for instance, OGMA and our two plants and one research center in the city of Evora that probably some of you already gave us the pleasure to, to visit. So in terms of disruptive innovation, just, just mentioned the Embraer X um, projects and announcements. So we have been developing also uh, with the UK CAA and, uh, and Australia and Air Service Australia, we are developing certainly not only the product, but very much the ecosystem. It's very important to have everything going, um, going together. It was discussed already this morning when we talk about these flying vehicles all the regulatory aspects, all the technology. It is very important to work across the whole ecosystem. And in, uh, in our case, these our two announcements are related also with the helicopter operators. So in a way, we're trying to see which aspects related with, with helicopters are there that can also be used and, and validate to this new uh, what we call and we believe it is truly a disruptive um, business in terms of the next some next aspects and future aspects of, of mobility. Certainly at, at, the, at the same time, we keep our good investments in um, and from our partners in the current products and, and in the current aircraft. And for that purpose, we keep our commitment in terms of these three main goals of, of climate change, of uh, this is not uh, a novelty for you, as we are all together in the industry in uh, in addressing this kind of challenges and developing and developing the technology base and the knowledge base to to develop them further. Uh, so, just to update you on on our global presence, uh, we have um, our direct operations in. Um, in the United States, also in uh, in Europe, but of course we remain a Brazilian headquarter company in all our business units, and with uh, an important center of gravity in terms of decision um, in Bra in Brazil. But of course, keeping a presence um, more or less significant uh, in terms of physically wise. Um, in, uh, in different areas of the planet. Also, um, an, an important, hopefully an important information, we have joint ventures and affiliate uh, outside Brazil in countries like, like Mexico, in the UK, here in Portugal. So, uh, and of course in, in Brazil that we use as well to diversify and in that effort to diversify we try to exceed the expectations, perform our our way, and and then we see that reflected in uh, in our recent products, like just to mention the E2 family. Um, now our most recent uh, airline already in operation, where we look at areas and and partners to continue to develop uh, technologies and mature technologies that help us to to differentiate our products. Also. In a, in a, um, executive aviation, where we are proud to keep the most delivered aircraft uh, in in this uh, in this uh, area, the the Phenom 300, also other other products that we continue to develop and introduce innovation um, from cabin to aerodynamics and uh, and um, and differentiated factors in defense and security. Just already mentioned to you our new generation C390 Millennium, of course, always aspects to customize, always aspects to develop further and a constant uh, dialogue with the industry to address the, the aspects where we continue to strengthen the innovation aspects of the C390, the Super Tucano, an advanced trainer uh, with, with other functions as well, uh, which we see always as a, a platform to uh, to differentiate and to develop new solutions and also 
just to give you very briefly an idea of our diversification, I mentioned OGMA here in Portugal, where we, we have MRO and uh, modification of aircraft and also um, some manufacturing. But we have we have a tech in terms of command and control and intelligence. It's a, it's a Brazilian based company with some projects already outside Brazil, notably in, in India. Savis is responsible and now incorporated in Embraer. Uh, with our project, the Border Surveillance, and I already mentioned to you, Visiona as our space company, uh, together with Telebrash, where we also work uh, with international partners, not only to improve our projects in Brazil, but also to bring Visiona to new opportunities outside Brazil. Finally, uh, a final, a last word regarding um, customer service, even at uh, we. In terms of the size of our fleet, we, we're proud to see the size of our fleet increasing. So we would like to uh, kindly invite um, the colleagues uh, attending today's event also to look at this area. We have important operations in terms of, uh, of uh, services uh, as we see our um, fleet increasing. So this is also an invitation to look at new technologies, not only in the digital area, but in terms of logistics, in terms of all the solutions that sometimes uh, when we look at SMEs, we we won international awards in projects with, uh, with very small SMEs. So it's suddenly about the, the specific um, competences that are present in those companies. We all know how that can speed up the introduction of new ideas and new services and new products that it can increase the value added to our customers. So we look at SMEs across the whole spectrum to see how the specific knowledge can help us to, to enhance what we do and to increase the, 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 the value of, of, of what we do. Uh, and certainly, the three areas we would like to keep in mind, we would very, we'd be very glad for you to keep in mind is, of course, the planes that we develop, the planes that we improve, um, the services uh, that, that we provide and, and the new concepts and, and, and the new um, models for, for transport like Embraer X. Embraer X has been a very important experience for us in terms of not only looking at how we are developing the flying platform and the ecosystem, but also a very important gate for innovation to bring to aviation SMEs and expertise, which are not uh, regularly and not so familiar uh, with, uh, with aviation. So in that, in that, in that respect, we, we believe at, at Embraer that disruptive projects uh, are very important to, to bring on board new players. We know today there are less programs, there are less OEMs, so it is important to have this cross cooperation with other industries. And again, disruptive initiatives and, and the ambitions and goals for the future in terms of sustainability is a strong invitation to have on board new players, additional players, and, and, the, and the best knowledge we can gather to differentiate our products and our services and, and comply with our commitments when we think again about the environment, and sustainability and the future. So this is what we had to share with you today. Of course, you know where to find us again. Thank you very, very much for, for inviting us. It's always special for us to talk about what we do to and to play the role we can play in terms of collaborating with Europe and, and bringing forward uh, the goals also also here in the continent. Thank you, Juan, so much. Thank you, João Pedro, uh, very much for explaining the footprint of uh, Embraer uh, in a number of areas, the value chain, the geography and so on. You know that uh, uh, the, the words from, from Embraer are always uh, particularly paid attention to, uh, especially in the Basque country where I think we owe you uh, the development of the aeronautic sector. So there were two two factors. One was the Eurofighter for motors, and the second was was Embraer with Gamesa. And uh, out of those two 
ropes. No, the, the whole ecosystem was developed in the early 90s. So thanks for your Juan, I, it's a great, it's a great story. We have to thank you because you believe in us in the mid 90s. You learn how to do very good wings that we proudly fly in our 145 family and then new projects. So we, we are the ones who have to thank you for believing in us at such a difficult moment in the mid 90s. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, it's it's uh, indeed a very nice story and that uh, that's a, a more moreover a lesson to be learned for the future, you know, that that the bits in the in the powerful uh, partnerships and uh, new technologies are the ones who really create the, the value and the jobs. So thank you, Jean Pedro. OK, so now it's time uh, to 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 progress and jump into our our next speaker in the list. Uh, so we are uh, we are moving um, to talk. Uh, uh, we go back to, to Germany and talk to uh, Elisa Bakartziva and uh, Leonard May. Um, they work for Lufthansa Technique. Uh, and uh, Elisa is uh, head of supply uh, and contract management uh, in the Lufthansa Technique. And Leonard is, uh, is head of corporate procurement intelligence and cash management. Uh, so welcome uh, to uh, to the conference, uh, Guten Morgen and Herlich Willkommen, as we as a Du hast the Boden. Danke. So, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Kardjeva, and today, together with my colleague Leonard May, we are really honored to be speakers in this conference while representing to you how uh, Lufthansa Technique Supply Chain Operations developed during the crisis and some insights about the way we are planning to go forward. For the ones who uh, who don't know um, our st company structure, uh, we prepared a very brief company overview. Lufthansa Group is divided into five main business segments. Network Airlines ranked among the world's leading carriers. The newly established independent low-cost carrier Eurowings Wuhanza Technique being the leading provider of uh, maintenance, repair and overhaul services in the world's airline businesses and logistics and catering business units. But being focused on the MRO organization, more specifically, in the context of the challenges we are facing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic situation, we can share that unfortunately, it had a significant impact on our key figures last year, and they were far below our initial expectations at the beginning of 2020. The main reason for this was triggered by the flight operations of our customers, which were heavily affected. Our customers flew at highest 50% of their 2019 levels. This, reflect, this is reflected in our figures as well, as you can see. In 2020, our revenue was 3.7 billion euros compared to 6.9 billion euros in 2019. And our purchasing volume was 2.4 billion euros compared to 5.2 in 2019. That's less than 50%. An interesting key sight here is that this ratio shows uh, how significant and important the purchasing for Lufthansa Technique is, regardless of the crisis situation. And last but not least, uh, we are very proud to share that despite all the tough circumstances in the aviation industry, uh, we still managed to acquire 16 new customers and concluded 500 contracts in 2020, which is actually a proof that Wuhan's technique is considered as a leading MRO services provider on the market. Having in mind how essential the supply chain area and the purchasing respectively in our companies, it is important here to mention that we have a very strong organization integrated into its structure, which uh, we believe is one of the key success factors for coping with the crisis as one company successfully. Talking about the structure, 
Here we differentiate corporate procurement acting as a process owner for both the strategic and operative purchasing um, processes. And we have material management services and logistics uh, integrated in the other business segments uh, accountabilities. Um, it's very interesting to share how our strategic purchasing uh, is organized. It is currently centralized today in the corporate procurement organization and is split it into two main clusters, contracting on one side and supplier and contract management on the other side. Contracting includes uh, activities with pure focus on demand management, contracts negotiations, source to contract, contract operationalizations and category management and in the uh, in the other cluster of the uh, uh, strategic purchasing organization the uh, clear focus on on time performance of the suppliers monitoring them strictly renegotiating with them uh, or developing the, the suppliers depending on the business needs of the company and uh, taking care about the, um, the claim management and supplier ranking. Although the process ownership is with corporate uh, procurement, here it's interesting to share that the operational purchasing processes are currently decentralized or the so um, or the, the so-called procure to pay um, activities. They are still uh, performed by the business segments in our organization and partially in our central wise in the Luhansk Technique Service Center. This is actually an offshoring division in Sofia for procurement and material management tasks, organizationally part of Luhansk Technique Sofia. Um, having provided you now with a brief overview of the Lufthansa supply chain procurement organization and its role, now we are pleased to share with you how the company and more specifically the procurement organization reacted to the crisis. First of all, similar to, uh, to, to many of us already shared during the presentation that we, um, that we saw, we associate the crisis and the challenges in it with great uncertainty, unpredictability, going upside, down and volatile induction respectively. As a reaction to the crisis, we planned various measures and initiatives during, um, during the crisis and we divide them into short-term and long-term ones. Um, at the beginning of the crisis, our first priority was of course the short-time measure and it was to review and implement all possible ways of securing liquidity and expenditure avoidance. This included, uh, this included external expenditure freeze, project freeze, recruitment freeze, as well as, well as immediate um, purchasing volumes reduction and cancellations, payment terms prolongation in the cases when it was possible to be agreed with our suppliers. Whilst having work on the short term solution, and ensuring stable cash management process, Lufthansa Technique started the future program RISE. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It's a long-term initiative and um, its goal is to make necessary adjustments to overcome the crisis and remain number one MRO provider for our customers. Uh, more interestingly in, in that context is the sub-program, Rise of Procurement, that already started in corporate procurement during the last months and is currently led with a strong focus on reorganization, process harmonization and standardization, clear roles and responsibilities, all aiming at cost efficiency. For example, referring to the decentralized operational purchasing process today that I, uh, I just um, informed you about, one of our goal in the program is to create center of excellence for operative purchasing and create a standardized, harmonized operative purchasing process with the highest level of automation. Number of other initiatives were activated with main purpose to improve our supply chain conditions 
provide tr transparency and ensuring transparent uh, and ensuring flexibility. However, if you ask us what was the biggest advantage for us in the crisis, we we'll all unite around how successfully and jointly we work with our suppliers and partners who really helped us to dynamically react to our customers' demands and fulfill our performance promises towards them, despite the volatile induction and the really strict cash management demands in Lufthansa Technik. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to my colleague, Lenat May, who will share with you some more insights about our way going forward. Thank you, Lisa. Um, buenos dias, hola a todos, also from my side. Um, Elisa has already talked about how procurement or supply chain measures um, have been implemented over the last couple of months. And we have noticed during the crisis that it's very important for us to be able to react quite fast um, to changing circumstances. And therefore, we want to put ourselves in a position um, from which we can better identify fields where those measures Elisa has just talked about can be especially effective. Therefore, we have shortly founded a procurement intelligence team within our corporate procurement organization um, with the goal to use data analytics and to identify action fields on how we can become sustainably better. Um, with many projects and initiatives, we aim to increase data quality and transparency, and we are very convinced that our efforts in procurement intelligence enable us to become more efficient, for instance, data collection for a buyer who's preparing a negotiation. Um, we have to and we want to identify process deviations even better, um, especially recurring process deviations. So being able to um, either adapt the process if necessary or to, for example, train the employees on how to really perform the process. So having transparency there in terms of um, being process compliant and then saving time and money, obviously. Um, it shall also put us in the position to identify procurement risks. Procurement risks can be from different nature, can be availability problems, very long lead times for certain materials, um, can be price, very high price developments, can be risks because of missing contracts. So being aware of those things and that brings me to the next point in order to become yeah, or to uh, enable ourselves to derive prioritizations and allocation of resources from this very analysis. So once we identify that we have a procurement risk for price, for instance, or that we don't have technologies covered on, under contracts or so, um, that we then can allocate our resources um, to the projects or initiatives where the resources can make the biggest difference, because as we all know, um, resources are always quite scarce. And um, yeah, last but not least on the left side, we want to challenge existing KPIs, tools, methods. Um, so of course we want to challenge whether we are measuring the right things. Are we measuring them correctly? Are we me measuring them um, yeah, on the same level or the same way throughout the whole organization? So making or creating much transparency, enabling ourselves to have a much better view of what's going Five on minutes um, within the company. Um, and that brings me to the right hand side of the chart. Um, so what we are just doing, I just mentioned at the beginning of, of the presentation that we have founded this team quite shortly. So we are at the moment um, developing a procurement intelligence strategy, which will be continuously developed further, of course. Um, but we want to yeah, create a landscape of what we want to achieve over the next years, what kind of transparency do we want to create, um, where do we see the biggest potentials in reducing costs, reducing time, increasing re resource efficiency, and so on. Um, we want to establish a procurement intelligence operation, um, which means creating or having a team creating standard reports, both for management level, but also for buyers, um, creating ad hoc reports for very special cases with suppliers, for instance, when we have very complex um, supplier structures or contract structures or performance structures um, so that our 
negotiators and supplier managers, the differentiation Elisa just has described, um, get to the best point of being able to, to, to having the best transparency over the data. Um, and we really want to foster data-driven decision-making in that regard. Um, we also want to develop a full impact analysis of our contracts, obviously. Um, so getting a view of how do our contracts really impact our production costs, where do we contribute to them, um, making a comparison between contracts and sales, uh, purchasing and sales contracts to so getting a feeling on, on where we need to improve. Um, also, we want to um, yeah, establish a cross-functional procurement intelligence community, meaning um, even though we are located in corporate procurement, but Elisa has just described that our procurement organizations are distributed also within the BU. So it's very important for us to create this community and this transparency over the whole of Tanza Technic organization um, to getting everyone involved because only then we can we can create the highest impact we're aiming for. And lastly, this is the one mostly going into the future we want to um, develop and, or, and also implement, of course, advanced use cases, um, which go in the direction of forecasting and simulating so that we really are able from our data to anticipate developments, um, be it on a pricing level, be it on contract level, be it on technology level, um, to, be ver to be able to be very proactive in our, in our actions um, yeah, to ensure the best for our procurement and supply chain organization in Lufthansa Tech. So that is from my side. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. Elisa and I, we are um, very happy to share some, some thoughts. And of course, we are both uh, very much looking forward uh, to questions later on in the um, Q&A session. Thank you very much, Elisa and Leonard, for uh, this interesting talk about the perspective on uh, Lufthansa Technique. Um, I have to say that we are 15 minutes late in the in the corresponding schedule. It's not, of course, uh, to, for you to be blamed. Uh, it's it's an aggregation of uh, of the five minutes here and there. But I think it's uh, I mean it's it's worth uh, deserving the appropriate time. Uh, and I'm sure the audience will agree that uh, that 15 times uh, extra is is a is a good investment. Uh, so the last uh, speaker uh, this morning session. Uh, is Federico Masobrio. Uh, Federico is coming from Thales Alenia Space, uh, and uh, we are we are jumping the topic into into space, uh, deep space exploration. So that's uh, that's going really to to uh, stimulate um, the uh, the the principal curiosity of humankind uh, in the boundaries of our of our civilization. So that's uh, great to listen to you, Federico. Uh, as a senior engineer that has been working over 30 years uh, in space related matters in the International Space uh, Station, Columbus, uh, the crew rescue vehicle, the CRV, um, the, the expert space rider and many other programs. So I think uh, we are really uh, fascinated about uh, the topic and, and we want to, to listen to you uh, What's what's next? What what technology capacities we have to build to arrive to uh, to the next uh, uh, human milestones? Eh, buongiorno e eh, benvenuto, Federico. Eh, tu hai il, yeah. il pavimento per per parlare a noi de, de questo topico. Grazie mille. Thank you, Juan Thomas, for your kind introduction. I hope you see my screen and you listen and you hear me correctly, properly. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to the organizer for having invited me to participate to such an event, to such an amazing event. And I will try to address in my speech the technological needs that the new space economy is more and more pushing as seen from the perspective of a larger system integrator. And I will focus our experience and roadmaps for space exploration. That's my field of Oh, OK, here it is. Um, let's start from the big picture. Um, in many ways, space is a resource. As is the case for all basic resources, everybody should have access to it. As for terrestrial resources, new business models for their exploration, exploitation are possible. 
As an example, let's consider water. And water is a precious resource and you don't need to be an expert in, in hydraulic uh, water plants or whatever. You just need to have a provider of infrastructure bringing water to you and a lot of other users. And that's what we would like to do for space. We want to be a provider. The fact that space is a precious resource is a well-known concept. And space is a perfect viewpoint on both our planet and the universe. It's a high performance research laboratory with conditions that cannot be replicated on Earth. And it's a strategic link with our ground-based infrastructure and service. And in the future, it will become a source of supplies, materials and energy. Access rights shall be ubiquitous. Access to knowledge, scientific and technological. New horizon to build a better sustainable life on Earth positioning, connecting, protecting, developing new knowledge. And no single nation can afford to undertake the challenge alone. New models are possible. No need to own a system end to end. The user can focus on their goal, not on the system they need. Commercializations, public private partnership, PPP approach. That's a new approach that's emerging. Less monopoly by government and agencies, more room for industrial and private initiatives. And how would Thales Alenia Space fit in this big picture? And we think that infrastructure shall be affordable, user-centric, flexible, and multi-mission. We believe to have the right heritage and the right mindset to be part of this. We have more than 40 years experience in human spaceflight, which is the next wave of space usage. We are always looking for new fruitful partnership and we are open to challenge and improve our approach to business and products. We are supporting industrialization and commercialization of space through an integrated portfolio of platforms. For very different locations, we are talking about low Earth orbit, lunar orbit, lunar surface and beyond with different partners and customers, agencies, small, medium enterprise, big prime contractors, different nationalities, targeting very different use cases, experimentation, surveillance, technology development, short missions. And finally, we bet on private investment in space and PPP with agencies. Industrialization and subsequent commercialization of Columbus. Let's start from an old uh, infrastructure, the International Space Station, it's already old. We contributed to build it and we have been taking care of the station and of Columbus in particular since its birth. We do now still do with Altec, a joint venture between Thales Arena Space and Italian Space Agency. And now, in close cooperation with Visa and other space companies, we are planning to modernize and to improve the offer for experimentation for the next year to come. And speaking about commercial exploitation of the International Space Station, this is a really good example. The scientific airlock we developed in business to business with NanoRex. Its purpose is to deploy CubeSats and Minisats and to expose payload to outer space. Bishop, this is the, the nickname, has been delivered to the space station quite a short time ago. And to enable the utilization of ISS, you have to reach it with payloads and to maintain it operational. And that is what we are doing through Cygnus in partnership with Norto Grumman. This is a great success story. At industry level, an agreement was signed more than 10 years ago and then the adventure of the commercial supply of the space station started. With Cygnus pressurized cargo module, we are ensuring a long lasting capability for cargo transfer to the station. And we are going beyond. We are constantly pushing the technological boundaries to improve the performance of our system and make it more capable to the benefit for our customers. And we're thinking about the next generation of vehicles, able to go further and serve new purpose like lunar logistics. And an important remarks, this has been made possible by investment made by our government that through the Italian Space Agency managed to start the space station development. Based on that investment, 
Thales Arena Space and our supply chain, including the excellence of Italian small medium enterprises, grew and became a major actor in human space flight, so strong that we could win contracts worldwide in business. This, I believe, is the virtuous example on how public funding can be properly used. The next step of LEO exploitation will be represented by private stations after the International Space Station ISS will be dismissed. We are providing our competence and heritage in habitable system for Axiom Space, for what has been labeled the first commercial space station, and there is to be the trade union between the ISS and what will come next. Reusability. Commercialization of space is not just going out there, do some school stuff and, and stop. It also means to bring something back and drawing economic, economic return from it. And therefore, after the successful flight of the intermediate experimental vehicle and you see in the picture, in 2015 with Space Rider, we and Davio are bringing back to Europe the ability to re-enter from space after an operational period in LEO, therefore opening new routes for commercial exploitation as a complement to the ISS offer. The next frontier beyond LEO is the moon. We are supplying the habitats and infrastructure to ESA, IHEB and Desperate, and at business to business level to Nortogram and HALO. In, the, in this picture, you see the rendering of the future lunar orbital platform gateway, LOPG. That's a mini station in an uh, equilibrium orbit around the Lagrangian point between Earth and Luna, that for the basis for future lunar exploration. And from lunar orbit to moon surface, we are developing main building blocks for the pressurized cabin of NASA human lander. This is done under both a US Italy government to government agreement implemented by ASI and NASA through business to business initiative. At the same time, we are developing for ESA as one of the two selected European private contractors, the European Large Lunar Lander, EL3, and the CIS Lunar Logistic Transfer Vehicle, CLTV. These systems will play a fundamental role for Europe in providing a landing and logistic service to lunar surface and orbital users. We go to the moon to stay. We are ready to support our government and DASI in a cooperation program with US government and NASA for the first infrastructure element of the lunar base. So we and the whole Italian supply chain will shape the first lunar infrastructure a surface habitat, but also opportunities will come for pressurized rover, cargo and more. And the lunar base will have to be supported by an infrastructure of communication, you see in the top right, navigation and time. Thales Alenia Space and Telespazio and other industries are preparing this new exciting commercial venture. And OK, now in the picture, well, this is just a plan at the moment. This is, will be the next step. But sooner or later, we will get there and we will exploit moon and asteroids resources and uh, stay tuned. And finally, to connect back to the beginning of this presentation, I said that we see the potential for a new global economic force benefiting the life of all people in ways we might not be even able to envision today. We believe in space as humankind's new horizon to build a better sustainable life on Earth. And that's all. Thank you very much. OK, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Federico uh, for this inspiring uh, final conference. We, we keep in our, uh, in our dreams uh, the last uh, pictures that you are presenting to us. So it's, uh, it's really amazing. So, OK, I think uh, now uh, it's, it's the last slot uh, of our morning, of our long morning, where we can have the chance to interact with, uh, with, uh, with the speakers. Um, so we, we already uh, talked uh, 
to um, uh, to the representative for, of uh, of Boeing to Kelly, but we have uh, now uh, our four speakers in front of us, uh, and you can use the chat to to send some final questions. We have a lot of them, so we have to get a little bit condensed and, and organized. So let me start uh, with Airbus uh, with Christian. There is a, a certain number a number of uh, a number of uh, perspectives and visionary um, scenarios uh, trying to imagine the their aerospace industry of the future um, um, one is related to uh, electro propulsion no this will be an issue of megawatts and therefore it has to be light megawatts and maybe that is related to superconductivity so you that are an expert in in, uh, in materials and uh, uh, will we have ferric materials uh, for for aeroplanes that can produce these superconductive uh, electric propulsion motors that can can fly in the in the planes? By when uh, do we expect to have uh, electrical propulsion in the aeroplanes? <clears throat> okay, um, it's quite a complex question, <laughs> I must say. Um, so we are working um, very uh, integrated with several teams yeah, to, to understand uh, the different um, challenges. Let's say coming, um, starting with, uh, with, with hydrogen, the storage, and the converse, the, the, uh, for example, the fuel cell. Um, and then, of course, then also the, the uh, electrical part and the, the power distribution. So, and um, it is clear that on top of the, the, the structural uh, performance of the materials, you would then have to cope with um, such new requirements coming. And uh, superconductivity is something we are um, looking at for um, dis distri distributing networks. Uh, however, it is quite complex. You really bring down the, um, um, the, 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 the challenge to where, where you can really um, tackle it on a material uh, level and the integration level. So it's quite really complex to answer. Yeah? We have the pathway and the, the, the timelines which were shown uh, with, with the vision to have um, the zero E uh, products entering markets in the, in the middle of the 30s. So I have to answer it, sorry, in, in such a wake <laughs> format, sorry for that. Yeah. You are muted, Juanto. Excuse me, uh, I, I didn't. I didn't notice I was mute. Uh, we have a question for Joe Pedro uh, and Breyer, and that is related to the Evolt program. So uh, they are asking about uh, what skills are you requiring uh, in that in that particular program. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, we we are um, we are linking the. The, the program as, as an integrator of some of our verticals of, of innovation. So um, it, it ends up in a very uh, not in a, in a quite obvious answer in terms of the critical aspects of, of the ecosystem that must be in place. Um, there is a long term vision in terms of being an autonomous system. So autonomy is important, navigation, link link with the air traffic management, work with the regulation. So fortunately, it's being a disruptive area is very challenging and attractive for different sets of, of engineering skills. But the best possible answer is it ends up with, with all these aspects that need to be brought together to, to build a very a, a dynamic and demanding ecosystem. Thank you, uh, Jo Pedro. Uh, there's a question for Elisa and Leonard uh, related to uh, the government support uh, during COVID. Uh, so, uh, to, how does uh, uh, this uh, help uh, produce the effect uh, in, uh, in Lufthansa Technique uh, uh, during this long period of one year with with few, very few operations? So the question is directed and how we had looked on the technique use the government support is that right 
so important it was uh, that and maybe what was what was the, the practical effect that that happened in your operations okay so um from the government support of course Lufthansa group as a whole um, received uh, a credit not Lufthansa technique as such but the group it's a credit it's not a gift it's just we have to pay it back with high interest and of course the, the operations um, were affected quite heavily um Turnover sunk to about 50%, 55% of what we had um, in 2019. Our profits, uh, the same. So the profit we had in 2019, in 2020, we had a minus in front of it. So um, it, it, it all went away. Of course, it's it's a very, very hard and critical time for us. I think Lufthansa Technik still has um, a benefit compared to the Lufthansa Airlines in terms of their global um operations and locations because asia and usa um or the americas they they recovered a little bit quicker than than europe did um so that was a benefit from us compared to to the airline which is just operating out of germany and in germany it, it goes very very slowly but still i mean 50 percent turnover not even 50 percent procurement volume uh big loss so we tried to to really um yeah reduce all efforts we did um, to what is operationally critical. So we stopped our projects and so we just did what was operationally critical to serve our customers because that's always the first priority and everything else we, we, we put on hold and we used in the, the short term possibility we have in Germany where, where you can receive um, some compensation, about 60% of the compensation from, from the state if, if people are not working. Okay, well done. Thank you. Uh, there is a question for Federico, uh, uh, and that is related to uh, again the, the crisis and how SMEs have approached the sector that has been less influenced by by the crisis, like the space. Uh, so I guess that uh, the newcomers, uh, SME newcomers with a number of capacities, have touched maybe your door. Uh, what is TAS doing uh, to support this welcoming of uh, SMEs into space? Oh yes, indeed. Uh not only, let's say, pushed by the COVID uh, emergency situation, uh, there is a growing um, platform of SMEs who are facing and tackling the space business in a very exciting and very smart way. So, uh, okay, we, we, we may see on some time, from a certain point of view, as competitors for some aspects, but definitely it's it's to be considered a plus uh, because uh, SME, SME is, have, have a very quick time to, to react, quick time to market, very smart ideas. Uh, maybe sometimes, okay, uh, direction should, could be, you know, too much uh, spread or around 360 degrees, but uh, out of them, uh, uh, excellence uh, a lot uh, very often appears and in fact for instance in the Italian um, space economy initiatives we are involving uh, sometimes uh, more than 50 60 percent of our you know uh, share uh, of, of large programs with SMEs in particular for instance in this period of time we are working on the lunar infrastructures and we are talking about a small sat constellation to provide for telecommunication or the you know, uh, resource utilization, mobility, surface mobility. Uh, it's a very challenging and very enthusiastic uh, uh, momentum, I would say. Thank you, Federico. Uh, we have another question for Christian. Uh, that there's one. One was related to hydrogen and safety, but I think you partially covered it in your last comment. There is another one uh, talking about additive manufacturing and metal powder. Uh, so uh, what is the current uh, share uh, of, uh, of this technology and what is the expected uh, importance of additive manufacturing in the, in the next years? You're on mute, Christian. Christian, you're on mute. Yeah. Yes. So, so powder bed, it's a very important technology for us. Um, however, maybe we have 
been falling a little bit uh, short in really exploiting all the opportunities coming along because we have also been discovering on the way uh, some some challenges for example when the, the surface um, treatment effects you know the fatigue performance things like that and then we also learned a lot about um, the, the business cases and how they can evolve however we are we are um, following that we are ramping up some some production and uh, let's make a little bit the loop into the, the future where um, things like heat exchanges uh, you might be envisaging with the with powder bed um, technologies and there uh, it, it, the powder bed really gives opportunities in having very specific designs here yeah, you can build very very small with back cuts etc um, you still have to have your your surface treatment technologies in the 3d volume <laughs> you have to consider this and then also for um, let's say advanced powders advanced materials bring that in yeah you really have to differentiate if you're going for titanium or um, aluminium or if you are uh, um, alloys or if you are mixing materials multi-material is something we are we are we are looking at there to tailor your materials to your needs which is also quite important for um, in the context of electrification what we touched on thank you yeah. okay thank you christian uh, very interesting uh, João Pedro, uh, we have a question here related to your uh, the em uh, Embraer positioning into into space. Uh, you were mentioning uh, border surveillance of uh, 17,000 kilometers. Uh, do you have an open continuous program related to to space, and uh, and do you position yourselves into into small satellites, or or you are uh, into a more traditional uh, strategy? Thank you for the question. Yes, we are looking at small satellites. Our satellite uh, project uh, company still has a strong center of gravity in Brazil with the national program. Um, but yes, we we keeping an eye on on uh, on smaller satellites as well. And uh, we um, in in the context of of our work, uh, we been um, listening to companies and looking at specialized companies and also also in Europe to see what um, uh, what is there in Europe what type of opportunities uh, can uh, can be forged together so yes we we take a look we take a close look at that the border surveillance is more on the side of of Savis, which is now incorporated into Embraer it's a more integrated projects with different type of platforms collaborating together to to deliver that uh, that project to the Brazilian government and uh, certainly uh, a flagship project that we also will look at international opportunities to to use that know-how. Okay, João Pedro, thank you. Uh, uh, I have a question for Elisa. Um, and that is, uh, that was more or less post, post uh, before uh, um, uh, for Kelly, and that is um, uh, how digitalization is transforming your uh, MRO operations. May, should, should I take that yes. one, Elisa? Yeah, okay. Yes, I cannot if there is something. Thank you. All right. Um, so in general, of course, uh, digitalization plays a plays a great role in, in our MRO operations. I mean, we have at Lufthansa Technic, we have the Aviatar, which is a platform for predictive maintenance um, where airlines can follow on the status on their components. Um, for example, when their aircrafts are in operation, that's one aspect. And then, of course, for more for our expertise, when we when it comes to supply chain or procurement, um, obviously, as well, it plays a huge role, I mean, um, especially through the optimal use of resources, because with transparency, um, yeah, being uh, able to, to have transparency of where we can be most effective or most efficient, that can lead to huge savings in, in procurement, and of course, also in collaboration on different aspects when we have projects within the whole Lufthansa group, not only Lufthansa Technic, but also the airlines involved having tools, uh, IT solutions, which enable us to collaborate on for 
tailored for supply management, tailored for procurement um, projects, for instance. Um, that helps a lot. And last but not least, of course, automation, especially in, in the more operational side um, with recurring transactions. Automation plays, of course, a, is a huge role. Yeah, and actually what I can add is uh, to refer to our presentation when we where we shared with you that uh, it's our really main purpose to uh, to become flexible, to react fast and to um, to keep a very good um, readiness, satisfying our customers and having in mind that uh, the induction in our uh, in the MRO site is very volatile and we expect to have it remain like that. We really hope for having that um, that tools we are currently developing, uh, really working and um, continue um, satisfying the, our customers' needs as a first priority for us. Thank you, Lisa. I think we have a last question the, for, for Federico. Um, there were here a number of topics, uh, so there's, there's questions about Venus and the, the last uh, two announced missions recently. Um, uh, there is questions on commercialization of space, and one that perhaps we could we could link uh, to this one, and that is what is the future of ISS? No, now it's funny that uh, that we were looking at uh, what was happening to the debris of the uh, of the Chinese uh, rocket uh, coming back to Earth, and we were very concerned for obvious reasons. But it, we were not so concerned about the fact that China is building. Uh, uh, space station for the next 20 years. So what is what is the future of uh, what is next after ISS? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a nice question. Uh, indeed, the, 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 the International Space Station has paved the way for the utilization of at least low Earth orbit. But then the next step is what I call the commercialization. That, that is uh, uh, provide the service to be able to use space. That that's the principle. It's not, uh, let's say, um, uh, an extensive use of I don't know minerals on the moon. This is not the, the case. Is to give access. And for instance, this uh, Axiom Space Initiative is planning to remo remodernize the space station. Uh, giving access also to private people, private enterprise, which may use microgravity for not only research, but also, for instance, for an orbit manufacturing of some samples. Uh, biological medicine, we have seen that, uh, for instance, in this experimental phase, that some seeds of micro G moleculars could be used then on ground to be reproducted and to 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 have then medicine with a with a different uh, um, uh, quality and, and and that's one of the example of, of, of commercialization and then uh, for 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 I don't know external uh, other planets or moon maybe moon would be another uh, step uh, out of the first and next ones for commercialization yeah okay thank you very much uh, federico so i think uh, it's well 5 minutes late so in the end we did our job and catch up uh, with the agenda uh, so, on behalf of uh, Egan, uh, from this tiny place in Europe, uh, I think it was a, a, a tiny place, but still big enough to, to host uh, such a big partners like uh, like all the speakers uh, over here. So we were really proud, and uh, all the huge audience that has uh, joined. So uh, maybe maybe it's only a symptom, but. Uh, this morning to me was uh, a few seconds, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, and my impression was that uh, it all went so interesting that uh, that uh, we didn't we didn't look too much at the, at the clock. Let me remind the audience that uh, this is only the beginning. So we have in front of us uh, three days of B two B interactions. That that it's perhaps where the real um, uh, enterprise interests can be implemented. So don't forget to. To, to work out your agendas and uh, I use uh, those uh, opportunities of the next three days for the best. So uh, thank you very much. Grazie mille, molto obrigado.
Thank you, Sia. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to the next uh, occasion to, to, to be joined all together. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.